Okay. Um, hi, everybody. This is Lelia Canforst here from North Coast Local Land Services. You've got a nice mug shot of me in the top right hand corner so you can put a face to a voice. Um, thank you for, for joining us. Um, there's a few more coming in but I would just like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land we're all meeting on today um, and extend my respect to Elders past, present and emerging. Um, so our main speaker is uh, Paul Park um, from Soil and Water Solutions um, and I'll be handing over to him in a second. Um, but as you can see, there's a little chat box in the bottom uh, right of your screen. So if you have any questions as we're going, as we're going along, if you can put them in there, um, we'll be monitoring the chat and feed them to uh, Paul at, at the end of, of um, some of his sections. So. Any questions, put them in there and we'll, we'll try to get to all of them. And if we can't, we'll make sure we follow up. So without any further ado, I will hand over to Paul. Lovely. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you to LLS for making this opportunity available. And it's, it's nice to catch up with everyone and, and have a talk today. Um, the aim of our talk is to just um, have a look at farm dams and there's various things we'll look at as we go through our program today. Um, I'm just learning this as I go. Today we're going to look at um, determining our harvestable rights for our dams, sizing farm dams and planning your farm dams so that what works best for you as you manage your property. Estimating our catchment areas which helps us then determine volumes of runoff into our dam, how much, how much water will run into our dam, what sort of volumes will be there and how we can design spillways and that will safely move that water in and out of our dam. Um, estimating our earth so we can use a simple formula to estimate how much earth would be in a dam if we build it which is a, a good guide for, for landholders if they're talking to contractors um, about constructing those dams. Um, lastly, building a dam, just some standard specifications or things we should look for when we're constructing an earth dam. And lastly, managing it, so existing dams and any new dams, ways we can help improve the water quality within a dam um, and, and makes that better for, for um, our stock and, and our own personal water usage. So that's our program. Um, we'll, we'll be, there'll be, hopefully there'll be plenty of questions raised as we move through it. Um, as we come to the end of each section, um, I'll do my best then to answer any of those questions that come through and at the end we'll have a wrap up and go from there. So if everyone's right, I might get started and uh, yeah, feel free to any questions as we go by, um, we'll go from there. So we met harvestable rights, do I need a licence? So um, in the Water Act 2000 when it came out, uh, there were some changes to how we licensed farm dams. And the, the main change was using a harvestable right on first and second order streams, building dams on those did not then require a licence. So um, licensing is basically dams constructed on first and second order streams that captured 10% of the average regional runoff didn't require licenses. Dams built before the 1st of January 99 that were used for stock and domestic purposes on first and second order streams didn't require a license. And dams up to one megalitre on small size properties, so properties that were may have been one or two hectares that using the, using the average rainfall calculator wouldn't have come up to one megalitre in size they would then be exempt and they would automatically uh, not require a licence. As we move on to dams in third, fourth order streams, uh, those dams require licences and there's a process which we can talk about um, to work through Water New South Wales to secure those licences. But the harvestable right is this area of your property um, and the regional average rain runoff formula and that was compiled by Water New South Wales and that is available on its website and it's just a, a runoff coefficient for each area that people live in. Uh, and those two combined detail our harvestable rights. So that's a process and we'll see as we go through here how we can calculate that. Um, 
stream orders. I know there's been one question already about stream orders. So stream orders are looking at an old topo, topo, topographical map. There were the blue lines on the map and a first order stream is generally that initial gully just below a hill line or a ridge line and then they would flow down and where two of those first order streams come together that forms a second order stream. And then, as you can understand, those areas get a little bit, the catchments get a little bit bigger. Um, the gullies can generally show a little bit more, a bit more incised or a bit more defined. And then once two second order streams join together, they become a third order stream and so forth and so forth, down from two third orders into a fourth order stream. Traditionally, uh, a lot of farm dams that were used for stock and domestic purposes are on first and second order streams. As we move towards uh, dams for irrigation or for use um, in larger areas and properties, they may have fallen onto a third order stream, but we'll see later on some of those catchment areas for those areas are quite significant and there's a fair amount of construction work involved in building dams on those streams. So yeah, first and second order streams, they're the ones that we can generally construct up to a harvestable right without requiring any approvals or any involvement with Water New South Wales. As we move down to third and fourth order streams, there is a re licence requirement, but there's also generally a need then to get some advice on how best to construct those. Yeah, sorry, this, um, this one here is just a copy of a topographical map for, for a region up around Gloucester. It's just giving you a better look at the stream orders, how they would find, how you would see those on a topographical map, and you can see again, first, second, third order stream. So it's something you can plot yourself off six maps or or Google Earth and things like that, where you can find your property and find those gully lines and those flow lines that run through your place. Good tool also to use with your farm planning as you're looking at how you're managing water on your property. Calculating harvestable rights. So again, as we spoke previously, determining your property area in hectares. So again, uh, most people know their property, but like a rates notice, rate notice or using a six maps or Google maps as a tool uh, to trace around your property and you can actually, it'll actually show the size of your property. Lease or registered land is generally not included in our harvestable rights, so it's just that parcel of land that we own. Using a farm dam multiplier, from the harvestable rights, um, Water New South Wales harvestable rights site gives you the multiplier effect for your property and those two together determine your maximum harvestable right dam capacity. Once we know that, then we can start that planning process, um, planning process on sizing and building dams throughout your property. Like I spoke about, six maps. Six maps is a great tool for um, plotting and finding the air of your properties and also locating the stream orders within your property. So this is just a slide showing a, a caption from six maps which you can log into through the internet. You can use the search button to identify your lot and DP or your property address and that will highlight your property and then using Using a tool on the right hand side, you can then go through and highlight, you can see the tool on the right hand side, you can flick between the uh, air photo and the topographical map and then you can again locate your property area and log in all your, all your stream orders and identify all your stream orders. Yeah. Maximum harvest of right. This is an example of a map for the north coast and you can see the isobars or the contours on that map. Each of those represents a runoff coefficient. That runoff coefficient is used with the area of your property to work out your maximum harvest of right. That site, that, this map can be identified or found through uh, the Water New South Wales website and, and going in there and searching for maximum harvest of right dam capacity calculator and that will actually step you through that process. It's a very good tool uh, for you to, to use to, to calculate their maximum harvestable rights. And 
and that's it. This is a recording sheet, which we use as an example, um, or the calculator tool on the website does that for you. So you can see we can, we can locate our property area, our multiplier effect, which gives us our maximum harvestable right. And we can subtract that from any known or existing dams on the property and their capacities, and then that'll and help us determine what we've got available as we plan, in the, as you plan your property management in the future. This is just another simple tool. On the previous page, it showed the ability where you could calculate um, the size of your existing dams. This guide is a really good guide in helping you measure out your dams using these simple steps. We can then calculate the rough capacity of all your existing dams. A really good tool, not only for the harvestable rights, but also just with your general farm management, trying to work out what sort of volumes of water you've got in each dam. As we know, just coming through the last drought, um, a lot of dams didn't survive, didn't last. Um, so understanding what size that dam was, and then any planning in the future might allow you to enlarge dams, clean them out, increase their capacity, so that you know you'll have enough storage to get you through the next dry time. So anecdotal evidence from the area I live in, the Hunter, and talking to some landholders up in the Cops area yesterday was generally anything under one million uh, litres or one megalitre of water generally dried up during this last drought. So that then become problematic for landholders having to, to move stock or, or get water to those paddocks. So a dam of about one million litres would generally see you through a dry time. Uh, so understanding and being able to calculate what you've got existing gives you that ability then to, to move forward with your planning. Uh, that's our first step. If, you've got, if there's any questions, uh, we can certainly pause now, have a quick look, have a conversation about those before we move on to our next next section on, on planning our farm dams. Okay, thanks, Paul. Um, we do actually have some questions. So Tom um, was wondering if you are adjusting to properties, um, can you have the area combined for one dam? Um, on either property. So when you're doing your harvestable right calculations, does it, um, I think he's trying to ask, does it matter whether you are adjusting it or can you combine properties or how does that work? Um, just got to be careful. Again, if they're adjusted, they're probably, the longer term is they may not, they may get split up again. Uh, and if you put all, you put your, use both of those in your, to determine your harvestable rights and build a dam to that size, uh, you've got the potential that when, if the properties are split up, you've got a dam that doesn't comply. Um, and if something then comes up, and then maybe a, a may good. Sorry? What about if there yeah. are two joining properties? Does that change it, if you own both of them? If you own both of them and you wish to go that way, you could certainly do that. But it just you've got to be careful in the future then whether if you split properties up to sell them, you could be in the same situation then. If they two can become on two different titles, if you sell one, you may have a dam that's over that harvestable right for that title, and then and then you've got the other side whether then that, that they could be restricted by Water New South Wales of what they can do on that uh, on that property there. So look, if it's if it's a longer term process where both the properties combine and you're going to manage that property as one whole parcel, you've certainly got the option to do that. Okay, and then we also have another question from Christian. Um, is there any form of water storage that isn't required in the calculations? So any form of storage that you don't have to do the uh, yes, make the right calculations. Calculations. Yes, there's two. If we have, if we build excavated tanks, so that's um, excavated tanks that are, uh, um, don't have any natural runoff in them, and they're filled by licensed water from a river or from a bore. Uh, those areas, those dams then and those volumes are excluded from the calculation. If you have constructed a dam for soil conservation purposes, so if a dam's been constructed to flood a gully head that may have been causing erosion on a, on a property, and the sole purpose of that dam is to mitigate erosion, that is then excluded from your harvestable rights as well. They then just need some documentation around that, that it, how it was constructed 
for soil conservation purposes and whether that's someone from Water New South Wales or from the Soil Conservation Services has seen that and ticked off on that. So those two areas then are excluded. So, but anything generally that catches runoff from, um, from upstream catchments, they're included. Thanks, Paul. Um, and to just to pop back, uh, Tom was wondering whether that meant with the two adjoining properties whether you would need um, to have a planning, yeah, whether you'd have to apply for a licence. No, if, if those two adjoining properties and you can build your dams underneath the harvest of rights of those two properties, you wouldn't require a licence on the first and second order streams if he chooses to run them as, as one whole property. Thank you. Um, I know there's some more questions coming in, but I think they will come under some uh, future sections. So if you'd like to keep going, we'll uh, crack on. Not a problem, thank you. So that, now we're going to have a quick talk about um, planning our farm dam. So as we as we look to manage our property and, and look at how we're gra grazing or whatever we plan to do on our property, estimate, understanding our water requirements and selecting sites that work best in our property fall, will fall under part of that planning. So what I'd quickly like just to step through is just some basic ways that you can estimate your water requirements that you need for your stock and domestic purposes. Selecting, selecting a site and dam shape that best, may best suit uh, the area or the property you're on. Estimating, estimating some volumes and runoffs from catchments. So just some simple guides that help you to see how much water potentially can run off in that catchment and will that dam replenish in an average season. And um, just the soil investigation. So just basic construction techniques for those sort of things. So um, estimating our storage requirements. So we need to provide sufficient storage for our total stock and domestic water requirements. Allowing some lo also allowing some lossage for seepage out of a dam, and also allowing some lossage to losses for evaporation. It's um, it's not uncommon for uh, for dams to lose you know 50% of their water because as you understand the the top the top of the dam the, the top of the dam below the spillway when it's full is the largest surface area. So evaporation occurs from probably our highest storage capacity of the dam. So Making those allowances in our calculations provides us with um, the figures we need to know then that will carry us through that next dry time that uh, will inevitably happen for us. So some of the basic things we're looking at is determining our stock and domestic water requirements. So we've got some figures from New South Wales Ag and Soil Conservation Service design manuals over many years that they've used as rough figures for for the water consumption per day, and as you could see from there, stock and, uh, domestic usage is an allowance for 175 litres per day per person in a, in a, in a house. Dairy cattle, 70, 70 litres per day, beef cattle, 45. So you can see some rough figures there that have been um, attributed to water usage from, from stock and in domestic purposes. So if we know those, and we know the, the, the amount of people and stock that are going to be using those resources, and we can break this down from a whole whole of property view, or even also just a paddock by paddock or area by area section. We can then start to work out what sort of water requirements we need in certain parts of our property or on the property as a whole. So, just following is an example of using some figures. So, if we had a, a property with four people living on it, we had 50 dairy cattle. 80 beef cattle and 10 horses. As you can see, we, we calculate the, the, the number of stock, number of people versus the daily usage, and we come up with some total water requirements, our total yearly water requirements. And you can see there, 250,000 litres per person, a million litres for dairy cattle, a million litres basically for, for beef cattle. So during the course of a year, we're going to need probably 2.5 million litres or 2.5 megalitres of water uh, to adequately supply that's those requirements throughout a, a 12 month period. So that then just gives you some really basic um, tools then to estimate what you need. So having those allows you to plan better and allows you to give you some confidence that hey we can build something that will get us through that next dry time. So 
really good figures there. There's lots more if, if, if they've got something in, uh, haven't got something shown there that you run on your property. Um, there's the Department of Ag and, and Water New South Wales sites where you can get water usage figures for a lot of those, a lot of um, animals. So yeah, this, is, this isn't limited just to that. There's a lot more out there for you. Now, as we spoke about um, evaporation and seepage losses, so we allow for about 25% loss through seepage in a dam. Uh, I'm not talking about uh, leaks, but there's just a general take up mostly in dams, just water being drawn in through the soil. Most dams do leak, they're very minor uh, and they're nothing to worry about, but that's just the nature of soils we deal with. Uh, there are small losses through there and we generally allow 50% evaporation loss. So like I said, that top one meter of water in a dam holds is, is the largest part of the dam, and it's affected most by those losses. So, so we then estimate roughly for every one meter, one megalitre of storage required, we allow roughly 1.7 to 2 megalitres of water. So, going back to our last slide, we needed about 2.5 um, megalitres of um, water to meet our stock and domestic requirements, allowing for seepages and losses that would probably bump up to roughly four and a half, five megalitres. So knowing that, we can start to then plan uh, what, what we need in our property, what sizes we need. Using our other steps, we can then sort of locate potentially where our best um, dam sites may be. Sorry. So, so Again, we've just hit the next section. Um, if we've got any questions just in regards to water usage, does anyone have any questions um, just regarding water usage? Um, we have some questions, Paul, but they may as well um, flag them for you now, and I think you may cover them in your next few sections. But um, Michelle was wondering about best run of practice um, to, to stop, I think it's to get to run off, to end up in your dam and not in the neighbours. Um, and also the best time to clean out dams, how to aerate dams and to stop surface plant growth, etc. Right, yeah. Um, uh, so, river rain. Yeah, we, 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 at the bottom of the last part of our talk, we'll look at op things that can maybe help with keeping our dams cleaner and, and stopping a lot of uh, algal growth and that on dams. Um, diverting water, uh, so diverting water from a catchment into your dam and, and not the neighbours, be very, very careful with that one. Uh, natural flow lines flow from through properties between neighbours, between neighbours and flow on, so on down the stream. If we start to divert water out of one catchment into our, our dams, we have to exact, make sure that it goes back into that original flow line before it leaves your property. So we can't utilise a, a gully line that's flowing away from your place or adjoining where your dam is and then capturing that and then not putting it back in that flow line that leaves your place. That can then, uh, Water New South Wales has a regulation on that. So I'd, I'd have to, you would best to talk to the Office of Water before you went down that process. Um, Maximising the ability to catch a runoff. So you can certainly build contour banks that increase your catchment area and move water into that flow line. So you may find that um, you can build a contour bank that just increases that catchment area into that flow line. There's nothing wrong with that. That's done quite uh, frequently in a lot of rural areas. But just be careful moving water out of one catchment into another without sending that water back into the original flow line before it leaves your property. Uh, best time to clean out dams, ideally just as the drought ended, um, you know, then you've got the best opportunity to get machines in there and clean out the whole base of the dam. If the dams are now full and you've got a lot of regrowth or you've got things that you may need to clean out, you can still do that, uh, but it's just not as effective. Uh, and that's just as simple as maybe getting a, an excavator in and having him go around the, the, around the bank of the dam and around the back of the dam and just cleaning out as much as he can for you. So ideally, I think we missed the boat on the clean out just at the end of the drought, but depending on what you're trying to achieve, if you're trying to get water plants or something out, you can still do that with, a, with an excavator. And again, always try to put that material at the toe of the dam wall, don't leave it up behind the bank or 
behind the dam or in um, areas beside the dam, if we can push it all below the dam wall, it has the least impact on water quality coming into your dam and also runoff from that catchment um, down into downstream. So that's probably, yeah, that's what I'd recommend at this stage. Uh, so we might just Thanks. Uh, move, oh, yep, move yep, on to the next um, section. Just Sorry. Yep, there's one quick question from Christian. Can calculations be increased if you have more stock requiring more water than allowed? Um, so I think that's around the um, harvestable rights calculations and then I suppose intensity of, um, yeah. of extraction. Yeah, okay, look, um, you would, you've got, if your stocking rates or if your water requirements exceed what your harvestable right is on your property. Um, you would have to then look at what what sort of what is involved, whether there's some intensive grazing, whether there's some feed lotting, whether there's something like that, uh, and, and how that falls. But you could always then talk to Water New South Wales and say, look, I need this volume of water. It may require it may require then a, a license for that additional water above your harvestable right. And if that's required then there's a process of going out to the market and buying that allocation of water. And the system that's set up now is within that water, water source, so uh, water rivers or underground streams, uh, uh, say combined into, a, into what they now know as a, as a catchment area or a water source. And there's all the licenses on that water source are logged and kept by Water New South Wales. And then part of the trading scheme means that you can then buy an allocation of someone who already has an existing license in that catchment, um, and then transfer that onto your property. So if that, if, if hopefully that answers that question. So yeah, if you do need more than what your harvestable rights are, your option then is to go to the market, um, and see what's there. You may be in a position where you can have a stock and domestic bore in that catchment, which can help augment your water supply. So that's just a case then of checking. Um, whether you've got groundwater on your site. And if you've got good groundwater, you can go through the process of getting a, a stock and domestic bore as well. So you might have other options available to you to source water um, rather than just dams where you may have access to a, to a, a river or a stream and you can take water and your harvestable, um, you can take water from those water sources using your stock and domestic entitlement from there. So if, if, that, if you have, further questions on that one, it might be worth uh, talking to uh, Water New South Wales on the, on the options that are available to you or a, or a consultant who can work with you to, to work on option, other water, water sources available. Oh, so yeah, I hope that helped Christian. So we might move quickly through to our next section and, and again we're just going to talk about dams themselves uh, and the components of a dam and again We've all seen dams, uh, but just understanding the relationship of them and when you go to construct what we need to look for. So basically the components of a dam are, we've got our excavation area, our borrow area. We like to take all the material if possible to build our dam from, that, from the excavation area which will be below our top water level in our dam. So by excavating below our top water level, we have the ability then to max increase the amount of storage area uh, and deepen that storage. So, like I said, we lose less than true evaporation. So, we've got our excavation area or our bolo pit. We've got our embankment, our crest of our dam, and that's there just to hold and capture the water. And we have our spillway, which we use then to, when the dam's full, to move that water safely around the dam and back into the natural flow line without causing any. In um, erosion or damage to to the dam or anywhere downstream. So they're the, they're the main components. There is cases where we may have um, trickle pipes or low flow pipes included in dams if we're on larger catchments and we have problems with uh, water running for periods of time after a storm event. We also have, like to in our dam embankment have our cutoff trench and you can see in that slide there we've got a core trench underneath our dam wall and that is constructed just to get a good seal back in a natural clay so the dam then, so we reduce the risk of leakage underneath our dam. Excavation area, 
So that's the storage reservoir for out there. Uh, it provides the embankment for our, the soil for our embankment, and we generally like a good depth greater than two metres. So you can see in that photo, in the photo attached there, we pull all our excavation from um, upstream of the dam, and it's all below our top water level. So we're generally increasing um, increasing our storage capacity, and hopefully that material is um, uh, good clay material that holds well and seals well and then produces the risk of um, risk of seeping or leaks, leakage in our dams. Embankment. Um, so our embankment is the, generally the wall across the dam, so it could be an L-shaped wall or a straight wall across our gully line. Um, it's all constructed from an excavation area. It's high enough not to be overtopped, so we like to have uh, what we call freeboard between the top of our wall and our spillway area, and that freeboard gives us that ability then that when we get a large storm event, uh, that any surcharge from the from the catchment above that's flowing into the dam um, can be held and then taken through our spillway without overtopping our wall and, and it, uh, compromising the integrity of the structure. So freeboard, we generally like to keep a metre between the spillway and the top of our wall because we can have surcharge of anywhere between two and 300 millimetres of water running over the spillway in a large storm. And we also have the potential for wave action on those really windy days to create a wave from the back of the dam to the front of the dam and that, that combined with the surcharge and sometimes run up to you know, 500 mils in height. So having that metre freeboard just gives us that luxury of a bit more protection so that we don't overtop and, like I said, compromise the integrity of the dam. We want our wall to be thick enough. We want it to be wide enough, so our batters to be flat enough that it's strong enough to hold our water. The, the batters and the width of our wall will depend on the type of material that's available to us, so a good clay, we can then construct it and maybe have flatter batters, but if we get into a sandier soil or a dispersible, a site where the, where the soil is dispersible, we may need flatter batters, which could be four or five to one, to provide that massive area to stop um, water from tunneling through or leaking through our wall. And, and we make sure our embankment is keyed into the natural ground. A lot, sometimes dams, we don't, the topsoil isn't stripped well enough and there's not a key put through, and sometimes dams will leak where the wall mat meets natural surface. So putting a cut-off trench through the wall is really important to, to building a good, solid and stable wall. We'll have some slides later on in, at the end of our talk, which will just set that out for you that hopefully clears that up. Again, we talked about freeboard on our dam is an example of a dam wall that has minimal freeboard. So the difference between the spillway height and the embankment height is probably only one or 200 millimetres. And over a period of time, we've had cattle traversing the wall and drinking from there. And there's been, you can see patches there where the wall has started to erode and it's not far from overtopping. So really important to set that freeboard when you first construct your dam so that these issues don't jump up and arise later down the track because to repair a dam like this once it's full of water and it's been compromised like this is a costly process. It's, it's a process of draining it, re-establishing, finding material, so bringing more material in and raising the, the wall. So, And that usually starts from the base, the downstream base of the wall and, and bringing more material in to raise that wall level. So getting it right the first time, very cost effective and and beneficial to the long-term stability of the dam. Trees on dam in walls and embankments. Uh, I think we've all seen this over the years where a, a tree will grow on, start to grow on the wall of a dam. Um, downstream, if the tree's downstream of the bottom, the bottom toe of the dam, you're generally going to be pretty safe. If we start to see trees on the walls or the embankments of the dam, there's a potential then for the roots from the tree to go through the wall and start to get to the water. And then when that tree dies, those tree roots then become a conduit for water to leak from the dam. So taking into account that the drip line of a tree, so the edge of the branches of the tree, 
is generally the line where the roots will be on a tree. We've got a dam, if we've got a tree on a wall like this one here where we can see the branches nearly overhanging the water, we can generally see that we make the assumption then that the roots for that tree are out that far as well. So uh, we had a question yesterday in the field, what do we do with that? Uh, if, there's, if you've just bought a property and there's a big a gum tree or something or an ash or something on that wall, what do we do? Do we leave it or do we chop it down? Uh, it's a hard question. If it's taken down then the roots die and then that potential leakage occurs. Um, if we leave it there, what happens in years to come if it gets waterlogged or it, also, or it gets hit by lightning and it does. So it's a tricky one. Um, a lot of the times if that tree is to be taken out, we would probably then have to look at ripping that section of the wall, introducing some good clay, ripping out the roots, introducing some good clay to create that seal again to, um, to, to ensure the integrity of that wall. So not just getting rid of the tree is not the answer. Looking to how we can remove some of those tree roots and provide that seal again would, would be part of your thinking as you go down that track of, of managing trees on your damn wall. Spillways. Spillways on the dam, sometimes they're the last thing that we think of because we, we're, we're focusing on storing as much water as we can and building the biggest possible dam we can to get the most um, benefit from it. But the most critical part of a dam from a designer's perspective is, is how we get that water back into the downstream catchment safely because losing any, any failure with that then results in you know, losing a wall or losing the dam completely. So the spillway allows the excess water out, of, out and around the dam and back into the existing catchment without damaging the embankment. And our spillway, we, wanted, we would like to be as flat and discharge onto a flat open area, well grassed area as possible. We want, an, we want the width wide enough to ensure that our depth of flows are under 300 millimetres because as the flow depth of the spillway increases, so does the, the velocity of the water. And as the velocity of the water increases, we've got the potential for erosion and scouring of our water, of our spillway. So um, a grass spillway, generally handle flows, water flow at about three metres a second adequately. Once flows pick up over three metres a second, we've got the potential to uproot grass or lift grass and then take it in the, take it in the water and then that exposes the subsoil and then we get the potential for erosion to occur. So reducing that depth of flow of the spillway reduces our velocities and allows that to work safely. Um, and again, this, the spillway, we like it one metre lower than the embankment of the dam. So as you can see in that slide where the arrow is, um, we've got an issue there. Whether it's a good dam, it's got plenty of capacity, but the spillway then discharges straight down the back of the wall of the dam. And as it changes, as the water changes grade, so it runs across the top of the wall and dips down onto a steeper grade, the velocities of the water change and they increase. Um, and then we've got the potential, that's where the potential for scouring and erosion occurs. And as you can see there, it's starting to fail on that dam wall. Same sort of thing here. We've just got some examples of dams that have been built. We can see on the top left, there's a, there's a spillway there, but there's a, it's flowing into a river or a creek. And there was a change of grade from where the spillway was nice and flat, and it started to run down the embankment of the creek. Where that join was in the change of grade, the water has then increased in velocity, started to scour, and a, and a head cuts started to happen, and started to scour back up um, towards the dam. And then it's, it looks like it's, it's saturated, so there's also, after each rain event, that soil is saturated, and you can see it's starting to slip and slide away. So left unchecked, that spillway would eventually eat back to the dam, eat through the dam wall, and then we'd lose the dam. On the slide on the bottom right, this is where a lot of um, previous constructions where we'd put a, a, a pipe through the middle of the wall and allow water to be drained through the bottom of the wall down to tanks or down to uh, areas to be irrigated and things like that. You can see there they've got they've built concrete cutoff collars around the dam, around the pipe that runs through the dam, but it's still failed. And that failure a lot of times occurs because we can't 
get the right compaction around the pipe compared to what we can get on the dam wall. So differential settlement or settlement at a different rate between what we can compact around a pipe as, as opposed to what machinery can pack the rest of the wall occurs. And then as that settles differently, we've got then a conduit for, for water to leak down that spot. And if it leaks in tunnels, eventually we get a blowout like we've seen here. So pipes through walls, very, very problematic. And if they're to be used at all, some very strong engineering around those would be required. When uh, area good compaction using whacker packers um, and, can, and and remote rollers or things like that with a mixture of bentonite or gypsum depending on your soil type just to help provide that seal. Now we try to use a uh, pipe around the side of the wall, so digging into the existing, the natural ground first and then that's far easier to, through a pipe trench to compact that back up and build our wall across our gully. That is the preferred option these days where possible. And again, another example of where a spillway has failed around the dam. See the dam wall on the right hand side. There was no spillway constructed upstream of that. The water's just run around the toe of the dam and it's failed there and it's starting to scour and it started eating the wall and it's eating back up into top water level. So the water level of the dam's starting to drop. The uh, landholder I went to saw. His, his process of trying to save that was to throw rubbish and garbage into that streamline, hoping that it would capture the sediment and the water that's coming through, and then silt that up and then backfill that. But unfortunately, it doesn't. The water then hits any debris that's, thrown, that's placed in there and just goes around the side of it. And you can see it starting to erode around the side of those. So if we get to the point where this has occurred, we've got to then look at some sort of rock structures or some sort of um, revetment work to help re-establish that, that spillway. The idea of just throwing rocks or bricks or um, timber or something in there can work. Yeah, you might get lucky enough to work on your site, but generally as a rule it doesn't. So being really aware of um, where the water's going once it leaves the dam, what our soil types are like, and how we can convey that safely back in downstream, critical part to our dam construction. And those photos show you if we don't get it right, uh, we've got massive uh, rehabilitation costs and they sometimes can be cost as much as the actual construction of the, of the dam itself. So always a big part of planning when we build dams is to look at that spillway and how we can construct that safely. Here is a guide um, for, for landholders and for uh, contractors if they're coming to do some work on a property to build a dam. And this is from a, a design and construction of earth dams written by Katie Nelson who worked for I think the Water Conservation Commission in Victoria and it's a very good, a very good book on the construction of small farm dams. And what it shows us is the flow volumes in cubic metres a second from three up to 15. So the discharge, peak discharge from our catchment upstream of our dam is measured in cubic metres a second. What that volume is, is determined by the intensity of the rainfall, the steepness of the slope and the catchment area. And there's a, there's a calculation that can determine that. And then versus the outlet slope of the dam. So what the slope is of the, of the area we're discharging the water into below the dam. So taking into account the slope of the land, which goes from 4% to 24%, and our discharge from 3 to 15 we just gather that both of those information and we can determine a spillway width. And that's a really simple guide that gives you some idea on minimum spillway widths. And check these against using um, Australian rainfall and runoff figures and, and catchment areas using traditional calculations we used many years in the Soil Conservation Service. And these are plus or minus one or two metres. So a very good guide uh, as you look at developing a dam, talking to your contractor, getting a, a gauge on what sort of volume of water there, what sort of spillway width you generally need uh, for that dam. So you can see there, even as a minimum, we're looking at six metres wide. So a really safe outlet with a really small catchment of only three cubic metres a second with a really flat outlet, we're starting to look at a spillway of six metres wide. So that's generally two blade widths of a bulldozer wide. Um, and so gives you an idea, because we probably see in the bush, a lot of dams are just one blade width wide. 
and then that's where if we haven't got that width, um, we can then have issues with uh, increased flow depth, increased velocities, and potential scouring. So, yeah, beautiful. Again, spillway outlets. So when we're talking about constructing our spillways, this is three general traditional types of spillways you'll see on most stands. Our first one is just our inlet and outlet. It runs on contour and down beside the edge of the wall. And we look there across where I'm moving the mouse now, you can see our outlet width. And that water runs on that slope back down to the base of the gully. When we, there's our, there's our outlet width. And there's our slope running back down to the back down to the natural the base of the gully line. So on the previous slide, where we talked about outlet width on the grades on our different um, percentage of grades, they are not a, not not on the grade of our spillway, but the grade of our natural contour running back down to our gully. So our spillway will generally be. 1% fall across the full length of the spillway, but our, our grade we can't change running down from the top of the wall back down to that gully line. So that's the percentage slope that we use in our calculation for our, our spillway width. The second spillway, if we've got an issue with potentially water running down the edge of our embankment, we can then we just put a berm or a turn on our spillway it increases the length of our biwash and allows that water to discharge safely away from our dam wall. So then we don't have any risks of scouring or issues or erosion along our dam wall. And lastly, if we can't do method two, we can then rock line or stabilise the toe of the dam in some way that allows that water to not erode the edge of the embankment. So they're the, probably the three most traditional spillways you'll see, a berm or a turn on the wall or just some sort of rock protection if you think there's potential for scour there. So again, examples of spillway outlets, um, that ability to move that water safely out of your dam, back in your natural catchment, um, very, very important. Again, hopefully before we move on to types of dams, do we have any questions on um, spillways or calculations or things like that? Hi Paul, yeah we do. So um, Helen asked if you have a spillway, what is the pipe for? So yeah. Spillway, what's the pipe for? Right, so yeah, yeah. in catchments generally, in catchments above 40 hectares we've recommended uh, that we use a trickle pipe. So that's only it can be a small 100 or 150 mil pipe set from a pit in the dam and, and discharged below the dam back into the natural gully. We usually set that 100 mils below our spillway. So what happens is when the when the peak rain stops and we get a trickle throw for our catchment, that pipe then picks up those trickle flows, discharges it through our pipe, and stops it from running over our spillway. Because if our spillway stays saturated from trickle flows and we get another large storm event straight after, that wet soil then is highly erodible. So its ability to, to, to not erode is compromised. So where we've recently had up to 800 millimetres here, we would have had events where the, the catchment was still trickling and water would have been still trickling over our spillways, and then we get another 40 or 50 millimetre rain event which causes a surcharge and more flow. So we always, in soil conservation, we always recommended in these sort of areas where you get high rainfall, and only go over about 40 hectares, just the ability to put in a trickle pipe to maintain and keep that spillway, your earth spillway dry was really, really important for the long-term integrity of it. So um, if you need some further information on that, I'd be happy to send you up some examples that uh, of trickle pipes in dam walls and things like that. And there'll probably might be something shown later on. So, yeah. Yep. Um, we can, people have used, sometimes used uh, pipes as spillways. So if they're using the, the dam wall as a, as a road access as well, um, a lot of people will use a pipe uh, you know, 300, 500, 750 mil concrete pipes as a spillway. Um, they can work, but just got to be really careful that the flow capacity of pipes um, a lot of times doesn't match the discharge from the catchment. Pipes work effectively when they have a lot of head, so as in depth um, of cover over the top of the pipe. 
which allows that head pressure to push the water through the pipes at their designed capacity. So if we have the pipes as a spillway and we don't have a lot of head of water or that ability for water to back up against them, they never really run at their full capacity. So you never then get the ability to, to take all that flow from the, from the catchment through those pipes. So a lot of times if pipes are used as, as so we can maintain an access across a catchment, um, we may then have to provide some sort of protection downstream over those pipes just if they do overtop um, and run through there. So yeah, we ha we ha there has been pipes and you've probably everyone's seen them uh, used through dam walls. A lot of times they just don't, haven't got the ability to take the full capacity from a large storm event. Lovely. Thanks, Paul. Any more questions? Just a, yeah, just a follow-up question. Um, the diagrams of the bywash or the, um, the I think it's a previous slide, the spillways, um, is the diagram in plan view or what's the perspective? Um, I think yes. Helen was yep. having trouble visualising it. So. Lovely. Got you sorry there. Yeah, they're in they're in plan view, so we're looking on top of the wall. We're looking over the top of the wall, looking down on it. So they're in plan view. Um, so if you looked at it from a section view or a cross section, you would see the dam wall sitting a metre above that spillway, and you'll see that you'll see that spillway cut around the side of the wall. So yeah, that's a plan view. Sorry. Thanks, Thanks. Paul. And we have two other questions um, that are relating to, um, one is around upstream neighbours um, using chemical controls for weeds in their dam which is then overflowing into um, the, the neighbours dam and how uh, to stop that sort of contamination. So I think that might be around um, the inflow controls. Um, and then another question is around neighbours um, experiencing erosion which is then affecting um, their property and who they can contact about those sort of things. Right, yep. Um, the chemicals, and that's probably not my area of expertise, but my suggestion is the more vegetation and the longer the grass, um, and you'll, you'll see at the end of our talk in our last couple of slides, having some sort of buffer strip or little sed basin above our existing dam gives that water that ability to slow before it, slow that water before it comes into our dam and it can drop out a lot of our coarse sediments, our sediments that go into the dam and, and filter out a lot of other stuff that comes there. Chemicals suspended in water, it's a tricky one and unfortunately not being a, that's not my uh, sort of area of expertise on how to, how to deal with that unfortunately. Um, and question two, sorry, oh, sediment from upstream. Again, um, my best contact for anything to do with uh, water flows and things like that would be to talk to Water New South Wales. So uh, in this area here, I've done some work with a gentleman by the name of Daryl Chaffee at Grafton Water New South Wales. Uh, he could be a first point of contact and maybe he can put steer in the right direction for uh, Water New South Wales offices in your area. Uh, and they'd be the best guys to talk about what the process is. But if you can't control that from your end, as far as what the neighbours are doing, that ability to put a little, like a little detention basin or a sed basin upstream of your dam to help settle that water, drop out some of that sediment and that um, soil that's been eroded, and then that then reduces the impact in your dam. And I've got a little, little slide when we finish the talk just shows how that can work. So, yeah, beautiful. That's got things covered, hopefully. That's great. Thanks, yeah. Paul. Lovely. Um, types of dams. Um, and we've all probably seen different types of dams, but we're just going to talk about a couple of the basic ones and the, the pros and cons of these uh, and when you're making that assessment on your property. Um, first one's a gully dam. So that we usually find a gully dam on probably our second and third order streams and as we move further down the catchment. And that's where we've got a bit of a broader, wider gully um, so that then when we build a wall across it, we can actually capture a fair bit more water than actually than what has just been excavated to build the wall. So you'll see there um, we've got a good S to E ratio. So S to E is storage to earth ratio. 
So in a gully dam, sometimes we can get five to ten to one. So for every cubic metre of soil we dig out to build a wall, if we've got a nice broad storage area, we may get five to ten cubic metres of water. So then the cost then of water impounded versus the cost of building a wall is is a far better ratio for you, so you get a better bang for your buck in, in, in another term. Whereas opposed to maybe a hillside dam or a small dam on the side of a hill, it's three-sided or a curved bank, you can see there the storage to earth ratio is, is really limited, so we go from one to one and a half. So that means for every cubic metre of soil we dig out to build the dam, we get between one and 1.5 cubic metres of water. So not quite as cost efficient, but every dam, type of dam, hillside or gully dam, has its has its benefits and has its place in managing the water on your property. If you live in hilly country, sometimes you need a hillside dam on the top of your catchments to provide water to, to get stock up there. Whereas opposed to gully dams, they can provide a really good storage at the base or at the bottom part of your property, and then you can set up a reticulation scheme or some sort of scheme, trough scheme, uh, that you can move water, potential to move water back up through your catchment. So yeah, there's two two different types of dams, two situations where you use them, and I think everyone's probably seen them on their properties or the properties uh, they've been on. Uh, but yeah, gully dams certainly give us that ability to get more value for the earth that we move and the cost to construct the dam. We spoke previously about excavated tanks and not, not the need to include them in our harvestable rights. So excavated tanks or turkey's nest dams for want of a better word, again, storage to earth ratio is generally one to one, but they're generally uh, used to capture water pumped from, um, from creeks or rivers. Um, and that we use that in, if you've got a high flow license or you've got an irrigation license, you're pumping from a river, have that ability to store the water and then reuse it when you choose on your property. Again, like we've spoken, not calculated harvest for rights if it's filled from a river and it doesn't capture any flows from the natural catchment upstream. Estimating our catchments area. So hopefully there's not too uh, not too many questions in around the dam. So I'll, I'll move through estimating catchment areas. And again, we spoke about first, second, and third order streams. Here is a topographical map from an area of Coffs Harbour where I've just run some calculations as an example for, for landholders to look at what sort of volume of water uh, is going to discharge off this sort of type of catchment and what sort of spillway width we need using, using uh, a formula that I've used through the soil conservation and checking against that, hand, that handout that was there previously, uh, those spillways were, uh, spillway widths were very, very close. So, if we've got an eight hectare catchment, which generally uh, on a first order stream, our catchment areas can run between one to 10 hectares. Um, we then have a peak discharge of, of two and a half cubic metres a second. So that is basically two and a half metres wide, or one metre high, or one metre thick. That volume of water is going to travel over that spillway every second during a one in 20 year storm event. So that's a storm event that technically happens once in every 20 years. If we move to a, a site two, which is a second order stream, that catchment area is 32 hectares. So that, in a, in a one in 20 year storm event, has a peak discharge of, of 7.5 cubic metres a second of water. So that's seven and a half metres wide, one metre high, one metre wide. And to safely bring that volume of water back into our natural catchment on a 10% on a slope, we need a spillway width of 24 metres. So you can see then, first and second order streams, there's still a fair bit of work involved in constructing a good dam on those sites that's safe. And you can see then if we move down to a third order stream, our area three, which is a catchment area there, it's 120 hectares, we've got a discharge of 21 cubic metres a second with a spillway width of 50 metres. So yeah, ideally it'd be a, a great dam site and would require licensing, but it'd be a great dam site with the ability to store a lot of water but a lot more design, a lot more um, construction is involved in something like that, and a lot more dollars. So 
if you start to get down to the process of thinking, can I build a dam on that size catchment, you, you start to look at getting civil engineers uh, involved in that construction process so you don't run the risk of having failures. And we've all probably seen large dams that have failed and the option, the ability and the cost involved in remediating or, or fixing those dams is quite extensive. So a really little rule of thumb guide for you just on what potentially the discharges are, what sort of spillway widths. And you can use it as simple as going back into Google Maps like we spoke about earlier, using the measuring tool to measure the ridge lines around the top of where you may think of looking, uh, looking at a dam. You can use a measuring tool. It'll actually give you that um, area in square metres and you can work that out from there. You can work out in it. So Six Maps is a great tool just to, to give you the basics on this sort of thing. So good rule of thumb, but it also shows what's involved in the design and construction of, of your typical earth dam. Um, any, before I move through to runoff and stuff like that, we have any questions in around that? Um, hi Paul, there was one question um, from Belinda around what are the licensing requirements for springs? Yes, um, generally these springs and bores, bores you generally if you're using them for stock and domestic, you generally like to have a bore license just so it's logged with Water New South Wales. Um, and then any of those details that the logger has goes onto a database which helps neighbours and people in the longer run. With springs, um, it's a tricky one uh, because a lot of times a spring uh, can be in that top part of the aquifer and in some cases that top part of the aquifer may be deemed to be part of the existing catchment. So there could be the catchment that you use to calculate your harvestable rights with. I've done a job recently uh, where we were looking at putting a, a, a bore in to extract water plus a harvestable rights dam. Water New South Wales then indicated, well if you take water from this shallow aquifer, it's still tied to that surface water, uh, still tied to that surface water. So your harvestable rights plus what you extract from the bore should be calculated together. So if you're looking at if you're looking at um, um, using um, uh, sorry um, bores or things like that, I check that water in some wells from springs. Um, different thing, spring will just fill your dam, um, and springs can open and close. Uh, at different times under different barometric pressures or different seasons. If you've then if you've got a spring that feeds into your dam, I'd say you're very lucky and I'd just be very thankful that I've got it. So it, I haven't heard of any licensing requirements around springs. Springs, like I said, can run perennially for three or four years and all of a sudden we'll get a, a really dry season or a really wet season, they might just close up for a while. So Belinda, um, yeah. Utilise that spring on your property as best you can. Whether you can put a little tapper in and or have it flow into a tank and then gravity feed out of that down to some troughs, or if it flows into a dam, uh, I'd say you're very lucky. We've got one here from Andrew. Yeah, um, I'm not sure whether yeah. you can see that one, but um, with stream orders, first order turns to second order when there's another first order flowing in. So one plus one turns into a two. Um, does a second order only change once another second order flows in, no matter how many yes. more first orders flow into it? Yep. yep. So yeah. So your second order will stay a second order stream, even if you've got first order streams flowing into it, until such time as it touches or joins in with another second order stream. So yeah. Um, go back up. Look, just, okay. yeah, you can see, you see through there. If we had, if we had, um, we had another first order coming in beside a second order stream before it touched, joined another second order. So if we had, oops, lost my little green um, arrow, unfortunately. So we've got two first order streams there. We, and then it joins, it starts a second. If we had another first order stream coming in there, 
that wouldn't change that stream order until those two second orders touched. So we can have as many first order streams as we like coming into our second order. It won't change until two second orders join together. Yeah, that's where we are. So, and we see that quite. You'll see that quite frequently on properties where you'll, you'll have a ridge line running around the top here, and you'll have a lot of first order streams running down into that second order stream, and then you then can look at what's best for you to, to construct anything in each of those in each of those orders. I hope that, I hope that helps, Andrew. Thanks, Paul. Right. Lovely. Um, we're now just going to have a quick look uh, and, a, and a good rule of thumb for, for landholders there, estimating our annual runoff from our catchment. So, we spoke previously about we've got our water requirements. We can determine roughly what sort of water requirements we need for our stock and domestic purposes. We've identified a site for a dam that we'd like to build one. But another good test is to say, will that dam fill? Uh, a rule of thumb around here, in, we use, and you've got an area where you get over 1,100 mils a year rainfall. Anywhere, in a, anywhere you know, five, six hectares and above, Will will um, will generally fill a one megalitre dam quite easily, but it's a way, it's good ways of estimating annual runoff. Um, we can use a percentage, so we use a percentage of runoff based on the soil types. So you'll see here um, we've got different different soil types. So we've got sandy clays, light clays, elastic clays, and they generally can yield a difference in uh, potential runoff. So the heavier the clay is. The less infiltration, so the more water then potentially it can run off after a storm event. So you can range from 10, 12% runoff up to 15 to 20%. So depending on the type of soil you've got on your property, um, we have a variable to allow a rough estimate of what water will run off from those catchments. Um, yep. So calculating our runoff. It's a simple catchment. We've got a catchment area in hectares, which we can use our six maps to determine. But our average annual rainfall, we can get that from our Bureau of Meteorology. We can just look that up online. And that can be generally around here, 1,100, 1,200 millimetres a year. And a runoff percentage, which we looked at before, 10 to, between 10 to 15 per cent. And a conversion factor of 0.1. And that all that does is it brings millimetres and hectares together into that one calculation. So all that is a conversion factor. Having that allows us to calculate our potential runoff. So I've done a couple for some areas up here in Kempsey, Grafton and Byron. Looking at your average rainfall, and these figures were determined over about 60 years. Um, looking at a 10 hectare, 50 hectare catchments with different soil types, with runoff volumes, you can see with a 10 hectare catchment, we're going to get 13 megalitres of runoff. So that catchment is going to yield sufficient water for that dam to replenish every year in a in an average season. And you've seen in the drought it didn't, but we've seen since the drought that, that dam's probably overflowed five times since then. So yeah, some really good basic figures for you to see that you know, a 10 hectare catchment will more than adequately replenish your average stock and domestic dam on your property. Um, calculating earth in our dams. Um, a really simple formula, and I like to provide this to, to landholders, those who are mathematically inclined, um, who want to have a go. If you've got a contractor that comes out and has a look at your dam and says, oh yeah, I can build a dam across here, there's, there's 4,500 cubic metres in there, so I charge $3.20, so that's $12,000, and you go, wow, that's a lot. This is just a really basic formula and system that you can use to estimate that volume in the wall yourself, and it's as simple as running a tape measure or a range finder from one side of the bank to the next where you want to put your wall, measuring your height, measuring the width of the potential, the width of the batters and the, and the crest of the wall. That little system there allows you to work out some volumes in your earth wall. So very, very little, little bit of mathematics involved, but quite a simple formula for um, estimating the volume. So we've got a wall height, which is H, a bottom width, which is two times our bottom width, the length of the wall, so the length of the wall across the top from where you want the wall to start and finish, the sum of our upstream and downstream batters, so that means what angle will we have in our batters, so we generally have three to one batters, so that means for every one metre in height we go, our batter is three metres wide. And that gives us a good safe margin for 
for sealing that damn wall. So the sum of those batters, which is usually six, and our top width, so our crest width, we generally have that at three metres wide. That allows vehicle access uh, and uh, tractor access across the top of our wall. It gives us that bit of width so we can get the right compaction with machines. We can get our cutoff trench underneath that. And uh, it provides a good thickness of the wall. So they're usually, that's a very simple formula. You may or may not choose to use that, but it's, it's a good tool to have um, up your sleeve. If you get with a contractor and you've done some rough calculations before he gets there, it can um, you know, just show you, you you're on the ball and you know what you're talking about and they won't try to um, pull a swifty over you like some can happen sometimes. Uh, like I said, I, I had a recent example of a landholder up in Tymore where, where the person who built the dam was charging him $1,000 a megalitre of storage and he said he had 48 megalitres of storage. We went up and done some survey on the dam, calculated the volume of the wall and the storage and come back that he, it was basically 14 megalitres of storage. So he went from a, a $42,000 bill to build the wall to a $14,000 bill. So just having that little bit of information, it gives you something to have those discussions uh, with your landholders, uh, with your contractor, sorry. We looked before, we spoke about typical construction of wall, typical specifications of a wall. Here's just typically what we look at when, when I've designed dams previously. This is just a good basis for us to start. Final design usually depends on your soil types at times, but generally if you've got a good uh, a good clay, uh, a good holding clay, we can generally look at that. We've generally got our crest width, which is three metres wide. Our batters are generally three to one, and you can see on there on the triangle there, it's three to one. Uh, we've got a cutoff trench through the base of the wall. We usually go 600 millimetres into uh, 600 millimetres into impervious clay. Uh, so we've stripped all our topsoil off all the way. We've dug our cutoff trench a minimum of 600 millimetres into that impervious clay underneath. Three to one batters, that's our three to one batter. Three metre crest width, upstream and downstream. So we look at, we, generally that's a minimum. Our three board is generally a metre. And that gives us, again, that, that um, security of if the wall not overtopping. If by chance you've got a really sandy soil or a really dispersible soil and you look at using a dam liner, uh, they're quite expensive, but dam liners are laid all the way through the dam, right up to the top of the wall and keyed into the top of the embankment. So then water, we don't finish our liner at top water level. Otherwise, if we get wave action and a surcharge, it can overtop the liner and then start to erode through the spillway. I, I looked at a job up at Scone that had a very similar problem. They didn't run the liner all the way up the embankment and it overtopped, scoured and blew a hole through the dam wall and all of a sudden we were left with a hole on a dam wall and it collapsed with the liner still sitting there. But very rarely do you want to use liners. Uh, they're quite an expensive process. Look at your soil types first and, and widen or, or widen, flatten your batters or widen your crest to help provide that um, stability you need. A um, couple of our questions earlier about managing our dams. Um, we're looking at sediment movement from upstream into our dam. Uh, a really good way to manage uh, that is to try to maintain as much long vegetation, long grass, uh, trees, shrubs as we can just up behind the back of the dam and maybe a little stilling basin or a little sediment basin there. So as the water flows in, any water that uh, flows at a velocity carries suspended um, sediments in it. But as it's, the velocity slows, the heavier sediments, the sands and the gravels and the silts and that drop out. And they can drop, be dropped out in this longer grass area and then not find their way into your dam. So that's a really good way to, to tackle that, is to, is to try to have some vegetation behind the back of your dam just to help capture those um, coarse sediments that are running through. So managing our dams, if we can, if we've got the ability to, fence out our dams. Again, we don't want to risk the the structural integrity of the wall by cattle moving around those and things like that. We can control our stock access to reduce erosion, improve our water quality. Like I said before, a lot of people will then run a hot wire off the fence and provide a gravel access down for cattle to get in and, and water. So therefore, you're not moving sediment into your dam the whole time. 
if possible, can siphon from the dam to a water trough uh, below the wall. And therefore, the dam's not touched at all, and you've got water then running through troughs. Drop silt traps upstream, maintain vegetated areas, uh, again, to capture as much sediment before it enters your dam. Planting trees around the dam. Uh, we don't put them on our dam wall, as we spoke about previously. Along the sides or at the back of the dam, uh, especially given your aspect, uh, where your prevailing winds come from, what your sun pattern is, putting trees and wind breaks along those areas reduces uh, evaporation through wind and sun. Uh, it can reduce the wave action against the wall of your dam and can reduce our water temperature. So, so if we don't, if our water doesn't get too hot, it can help control our algal blooms. A lot of our algal blooms occur when the water temperature gets above 22 degrees and we've got sediments flowing into the dams from upstream and those sediments can contain nutrients. Our algal blooms love, um, love those nutrients coming into the dam in nice warm water and then they take off from there. So being able to, being able to implement any of those sort of strategies certainly helps uh, reduce the risk of algal blooms. So ladies and gentlemen, that's it. I hope I've <laughs> I hope I haven't gone too quick. I hope that information's um, useful to you. Um, if you need any follow-up, if there's any questions coming out of today, they'll be sent to me and I can answer them directly back through LLS or back to you directly. But yeah, I really appreciate the opportunity. I know I have a couple of questions here um, and I'll answer those quickly. Um, can you ameliorate with lime or gypsum for dispersive soils in walls? Yes, Ellen, you can. Um, a lot of times you can just get a simple soil test to tell you how dispersible that soil is and that will give you then a gypsum requirement to add to that soil to help reduce that dispersion. And as a rule, we generally rip up say the first three or four hundred millimetres of the face of the wall, the upstream face of the wall that's facing the water. We incorporate that gypsum into that loosened up area all across our wall down into our, the base of our embankment. We mix the gypsum uh, up, or the lime up into that and then we recompact that. So basically then we, we, we're creating a three or four hundred mil thick blanket there that helps that helps reduce that dispersion and helps reduce that water infiltrating through that. So that's a lot of the times we've, we've, we've done that. So a simple test, getting your, getting your uh, gypsum requirements through my experience, it's generally five, between five and ten percent gypsum by volume. So, if you know you've got a wall x amount wide, x amount high, you can then work out that volume in that top three or four hundred millimeters. And then, once you've got that volume of soil, ten percent of gypsum added to that can generally do that. But getting some sort of test from Wollongong Lab or an accredited lab will help you determine the dispersion of that soil and what sort of amelioration you need. Um, so I hope that's helpful. How long? Um, prior to investing in a liner, have you ever heard of a wombat going through a liner? I haven't, but I've certainly seen what wombats have done through dam walls, and, and I've seen them tunnel tunnel through dam walls, and I've seen them tunnel through a lot of rehabilitation work we've done in catchments around the Hunter, Hunter Valley. So um, liners also, if stock get in there, the, hoof, the hoofs can rip them and things like that. So You'd have to is management that would go along with putting a liner in. That's for sure. You'd want to exclude everything out of that dam, otherwise you've got that risk. And, and then when I talk about liners, we usually talk about the two mil thick liner. So it's not the builder's plastic. Uh, sometimes they're used in that bottom 300 mils, and then soils placed over those just as a backup. But generally, dam liners are two millimeters thick. They're very expensive process. Um, yeah, you can look at eight dollars a square meter to build a liner. Yeah, sorry. Loath to cut off any uh, chat about wombats or liners, but I'm just conscious of time, and I see there's still a lot of questions in the chat, which we will uh, try to get to either at the end or um, send out in our our response. But um, Thank you, Paul. But we've now got Phil Kemsley uh, from the Animal Health Team of North Coast Local Land Services um, coming online, who's going to uh, tail end this with um, a bit more info from the animal health perspective and water. Um, so thank you, Paul. And over to you. Um. 
Park, good afternoon all. Um, yeah, thanks for the opportunity to share with you a few animal health and production uh, issues that we uh, find with uh, stock water. I'll be dealing not just with uh, dams that all are uh, covered, but with uh, all, all uh, water sources. Okay, just, just to kick off with, um, just a reminder that uh, stock water provision, adequate water and quality, is not just a matter of uh, animal productivity and health, but there's also legal obligations that go with that under uh, provisions on animal welfare legislation. I'm going to cover a few factors today. Um, we'll kick off with water quality. So water can be uh, quite a few different sources, uh, and we see most of these uh, on the north coast. Um, but basically we're looking at a, uh, when it comes to quality, a real complex between um, uh, animal factors, soil factors, um, and so on and so forth that, that determine our water quality. Um, temperature and environment certainly have a lot to do with it. There are a number of ways that we can uh, measure water quality um, and the chemical content and salinity is, is one of those. Um, I'll be dealing a little bit later in my talk with uh, how you can actually measure um, the, uh, the quality of water through uh, water testing uh, that local land services currently have a program for to cover the laboratory tests, um, uh, the cost of the laboratory tests associated with that. So water quality uh, can change with quite a few factors. Um, and uh, certainly um, the requirements there for quality are going to vary with animal type. Um, the uh, intensive industries tend to have a, a high uh, water quality requirement, and certainly there's a big difference uh, between uh, dairy cattle and beef cattle. I'm going to touch a little bit later on ambient and water temperature and how that affects intake. Um, and also on breed, um, with the uh, Brahmins and their crosses having a lower water intake requirement. Salt poisoning is an interesting one, and it's not not it's not so much associated with uh, salt content of the water, but in terms of the quantity of water that's taken in. Where we do see salt poisoning issues. Um, and pigs are the most vulnerable species to that, is where there's water deprivation and then sudden access to water. Um, that's a, um, that sudden access can cause uh, swelling in the brain and, uh, and death uh, as a result of that. We can also see that in cattle, um, particularly during hot weather, uh, where they've been deprived of water and then have access uh, to that again. I'll also be talking on a number of toxicities that we see here on the north coast um, and diseases associated with water quality. A lot of uh, the intake of cattle has to do with how potable that water is. Would you drink it yourself is always a good guide. Um, the uh, turbidity pays a part in that but also the degree of contamination that occurs in the environment. Um, the uh, toxic elements and residues don't, don't play a great deal uh, into our situation on the north coast, um, but certainly, uh, certainly our livestock are the main ones that reduce the water quality through getting in there and plugging it up during dry times. Okay, here's what vets love to talk about and some of the disease conditions that we see uh, here on the North Coast. So um, we find uh, botulism is our biggest uh, animal health problem 
um, from water quality on the north coast. Um, next to black leak, it's our biggest clostridial disease, and we see that for a variety of reasons. But most of it is associated with um, cattle accessing water with rotting vegetation or sometimes rotting animals in it. There's not a winter that goes past where we don't get uh, botulism cases. And in some areas, particularly those more poorly drained areas towards the coast, um, uh, we can see some uh, heavy losses from it um, year in, year out. Um, it's, it's a real headache for us. We do have a vaccine available for that. And in the new edition of the Cattle Health Book, um, I'm putting botulism up as an essential um, vaccination requirement for cattle in those prone areas. Another disease that we see seasonally is a disease called Yersinia. Uh, most of the locals know that by the name of flood mud scows, um, and it's basically uh, rotting vegetation uh, in, in water supply. And uh, we have some years, the year, winter before last was a notoriously bad year, uh, where water quality fell and cattle were getting into those poorly drained areas. Sometimes in late summer, we see blue-green algae. Um, that varies from year to year and, and, and on nutrient content in the water. So that's the rule of thumb we use, but of course, we need to, uh, need to qualify that. I don't expect you to go out and drink out of a cattle trough. Um, water quantity. Now, there's consumption figures on DPI uh, website about just about what cattle require. Um, and I'll talk cattle because that's what I mainly deal with. But for those that do run sheep, uh, you'll see that the um, water requirements are a lot lower on a per kilo basis, live weight basis, and also their tolerance to salt is a lot, lot higher than cattle. One thing to bear in mind, and here's where we run into real problems with water quantity, is uh, increased consumption that occurs during uh, hot, dry conditions. Um, cattle just drink more as they get hotter. And it's also a time when our um, water uh, our quantity and quality available um, is at its poorest. Okay, air temperature and water temperature. These are critical factors. Oftentimes, cattle will limit their water intake if it's hot. Um, having been through the, the fires and fire recovery, I've seen the damage that um, fire can do to polypipe above ground. But also, it, it acts as a solar panel, um, solar hot water service, if you like, uh, to water. So that by the time the water hits the trough, it, it's just too plain on some times of day. The cattle will not, they'll adjust their drinking behaviour to the cooler times to be able to handle that warm water. Um, it does reduce their opportunity to take water in, not encourage burial of pipes. Feed tight um, certainly changes their water intake, and cattle um, that are on high fibre dry feed, such as hay or standover feed in winter, have a much higher water requirement than they do when things are short and green and the feed's full of water. Um, I've already spoken about uh, Brahmins needing uh, less water, a lot less water than, than, uh, than the British breeds. And that's also related to their grazing pattern because it tends to be more nocturnal um, than the British breeds, which will spread their grazing over the course of the day. Um, and the, the other important aspect, of course, is class, because if a cow is lactating, be it a dairy cow or a cow with calf a foot, they're going to uh, need a lot more water. Okay, um, looking at water types, um, we see, as vets, see a lot of issues with cattle accessing uh, water through dams um, or through, through creeks. Um, but that, that can present two ways. One is in feet problems uh, with foot abscess and foot rot becoming a real problem when cattle are walking through mud all the time 
because of that wetting effect and also the water maceration effect on the feet, which acts as a portal of entry uh, for bacteria. Um, the other is, is during dry times when cattle condition is back, that can act as a, a place where they'll get bogged. Um, and that, that is a real welfare problem. An interesting one about showing cattle water. Um, this can be a real issue with new cattle, particularly introduced weaners. Um, and we recommend either mustering the cattle onto water to show them where it is, or indeed to have um, older cattle that know the paddock to lead the way. Uh, for those who run sheep, particularly merinos, merino weaners, um, can be a real headache. They'll, they'll end up going and starving, or sorry, dehydrating up one end of the paddock um, when there's ample water available in troughs at the other end. Um, I guess it comes as no surprise that improved water quality uh, and quantity and delivering the water in the right way um, means that cattle are going to drink more um, and drinking more means that they're able to increase their gut turnaround time, which leads to greater feed intake and greater uh, productivity, be it milk or meat. Um, we currently, local land services are subsidising water quality testing. Kits are available both from local land services and from DPI. Um, this looks at things like uh, calcium hardness, uh, salinity, uh, electrical conductivity, um, nitrates and, and other um, aspects of water quality. Separate tests can be done for coliform, which is a measure of organic matter. Um, and, uh, and also, and also blue-green algae, but they're not covered off on our standard tests. Um, that's uh, that's about me. Uh, I'm putting it now open to any questions that are coming up, um, and I'll put it through to Leela there for, as a moderator. Thanks, Phil. That was uh, you cracked through that. Brilliant. Um, so we are two o two, bang on time. Um, there's some people popping now. If there's any questions, um, but we are scheduled to uh, to wrap it up now. So I'll just give a couple of seconds for anyone that might be typing a question. But other than that, thank you for uh, attending, everyone, and. We um, will be emailing you to let you know when the recording will be available on our YouTube channel. And also, there was a few questions for Paul at the end of his presentation, which we will email out as well. Um, so thanks again, and um, hopefully we'll see you all, you know, see you typing at the next one. Um, alrighty, that's it.